The mind is like a parachute. It only works when it is open. So if you have not an open mind, nothing is coming in. This episode of TOT the podcast is brought to you by... Electric tractors. Welcome back, guys, to TOT the podcast. I'm super excited today to bring you this conversation. There was a book I mentioned in Journey On, the podcast from Warwick Schiller, a book that I was inspired about at that time, in which a lot of people were interested to ask where we got it. The book, Psycho Behavioral Vision Enhancement by Albert Shankman, that book was given to me by my guest today. My guest today is an inspiring person in my life, someone I am very grateful for, for many reasons. I feel in a way that I striked it lucky in this instance, because in our circumstances, sometimes it can go the other way. You'll learn about that more as we go along. He's a self-made man, an entrepreneur. In my eyes, a man who has been willing to take big risks in his life. He's built and made multiple successful businesses, the current and very successful one being Old Balance, I balance a visual optometry center here in the Netherlands, helping many people with a wide variety of complaints, often caused by trauma and or a dysfunctional way in which we are living in our modern society today. He is a member of BOAF, Behavioral Optometry Academy Foundation, here based in Europe. He's a member of BABO, it's the British Association of Behavioral Optometrists, and a member of the International OEP Foundation, Optometric Extension Program Foundation, which is the international organization dedicated to advancement of optometry with an emphasis on behavioral optometry and vision therapy. He is of retiring age, but is still going full gas and does not seem to be pulling up anytime soon with a very large demand of people wanting to come to his practice, which he runs together with his wife and being very health and fitness conscious person cycling up to or at least 100 kilometers a week he's a wonderful father to two beautiful daughters with his beautiful wife thriving in a successful marriage for almost uh, 43 years he is the opa to my children or should i say opa (laughs) and he is the father to my wife and my father-in-law rob Chavis. welcome to the tt podcast Thank you for a nice introduction. You have to be have to give a nice introduction because you're a son in law. Yes, it's probably the only time though. So uh, <laughs> it's good that it's recorded. Well, I'm honored to be here. Yeah. Nice. So we have a lot of interesting conversations um, together, which of course is one of the things I'm very grateful for. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping today is going to be one of them. Um, in a lot of our conversations we have, we talk about the similarities between our occupations and our professions. A lot of the conversations are to do with behavior awareness, learning theory, and learning process. But before I start on that, I just want to clarify some things for the people that are listening and to give them more of an insight of what you do, why you do it. Um, And the first one, probably an important one, is what is the definition and distinction, distinction between an optician, an ophthalmologist, and an optometrist? Okay, uh, you want a short answer? <laughs> uh, it's, well, it's quite easy. An ophthalmologist is looking only for the health of the eyes, and the optician is making glasses to make a, have a perfect eyesight. But we, as a behavioral optometrist, we look at facial function, and that's totally different. Because when you have healthy eyes, you have good vision. It's totally different than can you use it like it has to be in a proper way. So that's the difference between the, the, all the professions. And everybody knows the ophthalmologist, and everybody knows an optician, but nobody's aware. What is an, uh, a behavioral optometrist doing? Yeah. Because we do a, some sort of visual therapy uh, with, with eyes and visual systems. Eyes is not, it's, it's just a visual fish system. And an ophthalmologist is more somebody that possibly would do surgery or... Yeah, yeah, looking for the health, yeah, with a medical problem. Eye doctor. Yeah, an eye doctor, and we look for a functional problem. Mm-hmm. So there are healthy people with a lot of complaints, and they have good vision, uh, good eyesight, but bad vision. And that's totally different. And an optician is, of course, someone that's testing your eyes, saying you need glasses. Yeah, and... yeah, yeah. And then they have perfect eyesight. They have a 20-20 vision. Like, they can't work with it. Yeah. yeah. They'd like me, a perfect vision, but I can't see anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, seeing without looking. Yes, that's yeah. right. 
Um, so how did you get into the field? Uh, because I was an optician in, in my younger days and I was frustrated by that I made the perfect glass and perfect uh, contact lenses and have a perfect eyesight, but still a lot of um, uh, vision problems and complaints are just occurring. Mm -hmm. So we went to an, uh, in 1998 to a uh, conference in Washington, D.C., and then opened our eyes. We said, this is what we have to do. It's more just an eyesight. You have to uh, take care of the condition of the visual system. And especially in the modern times, you, have, you need perfect vision. And you don't have perfect vision, you can't function. And since then, we do. Uh, we start all kinds of courses, and and we build up experience. And that's why I'm still working because it's not working; it's a hobby. <laughs> and so, in the practice, what are the people? What are the common complaints, or what are the sort of things you're helping people with? And how are you? Yeah, we, we, we're them? starting with children with learning dis disabled because if you can't see, you can't read. And so, a lot of learning processes are uh, dependent on your vision quality. And nowadays we do a lot of trauma patients, traumatic brain injury. And when, when they hit their head or they're falling down, they're falling down from a horse and they had a lot of complaints. They can't function anymore. So their sensory system is not working like it should be. Yeah. And so it, people coming in with those complaints, of course, it's a very extensive explanation of how you help them. But of course, it starts with an assessment. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically yeah. seeing. Yeah, the nice thing is that we can measure how they are functioning. Mm -hmm. and, and that we can explain, it's logical we have complaints, we can see it in our measurements. So we can measure outside what is happening inside. Yeah. And that's also really helpful for the people because we, we, we one of the, most of the time we are one of the first person who are recognized their problems. Yeah. yeah. Because you have all kinds of medical exams, you went to an eye doctor, to a neurologist, and everything was okay. Yeah, but we still have a lot of complaints. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's very really big. My our life and our work really um, rewarding. Yeah, yeah. And that's also the similarity. I of course with the horse have the same thing. People are coming with symptoms, and the, you, you're there the first time, and you recognize the cause. Yes, the cause. And then when you start to solve the cause, of course, the people have relief from the symptoms. Yeah, that's why we like to have conversations. We never have discussions. We always have conversations because we recognize what you're doing with horse, we are doing with people. It's more or less the same. Yeah. Yeah. And it's lucky to, good, to have a good relationship with the father-in-law that we always have yeah, conversations, yeah. not discussions. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. <laughs> so what is the main thing that is failing people in the modern society? How has life changed from former times and what kind of effect does that have on us? Yeah, that's a really good question because uh, 100 years ago, uh, we don't have work because then we are living in a normal, healthy, natural environment. But nowadays, and since the digital revolution, people are just focusing on the telephone. And they are not aware what's happening around there. And, yeah, so natural recovery is always coming in natural circumstances. And it's not an in insight. Because the most people who are coming to our place are people with insight professions. Yeah. And people with an outdoor profession, like, like a farmer or uh, people who are working with horses, we don't see them that often. And it's most of the time where they are working with screens, and have to do a lot of unhealthy things, yeah, then they have the, a lot of complaints. And, and of course, you see that then more and more, of course, with the way the world's oh, yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, You're busy it. because of digital technology. And of course, especially starting with children. Yeah, yeah. When, like you say, former times, we are outside more, we are playing more, and now... Yeah, well, I'm really concerned about the children who are now growing up. They, they're growing up with screens, and they are not moving, and they're only looking at the short distance, and they are losing the ability to use their spatial awareness. Yeah. A spatial awareness, that's the most important thing that we have. And we are, if you are not using that, you are losing the ability, the neurological connection in your brain to use it. Yeah. yeah. I always find it interesting when you make the simple comparison of the percentage of time that we, that's now switched where before we were yeah. looking in a distance. Yeah. For example, 50 years ago, yeah, most of the time you're looking in a long distance in the outside environment and only when you are resting, you're looking at the short distance. That's eating, our, eating. Yeah, eating. Yeah, that's our natural uh, capacity. Yeah? Yeah. Now it's the other way around. Now we are looking from inside out instead of outside in. Yeah. And if you're like standing all day uh, with uh, uh, with your head down, it, then just, it's very long as you, our head is down, it's working, but you have to, you can't go up anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Now you are, it's a cramp of your system and not only your physical system, but yeah. totally all the neurological systems are in a stress situation. Yeah. Yeah. 
But it's, it's, it's then no wonder that we have a lot more, seems to have a lot more depression, a lot more stress, a lot more people struggling. If we're normally or we're made or built to look 90% at a distance and, and 10% here, and now it's the other way around. We're 90% of the time here. And maybe for some people, only a few percent of the time looking at a distance. Yeah. Puts your system. People are watching on the telephone, what's the weather outside? And it's so, that's stupid, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So let's get into some of the juicy stuff. I am uh, I'm very excited about a lot of these things. Some of these things, guys, will sound um, quite complicated in the wording, but from uh, Rob's perspective, and which has also been very helpful to me, he, Rob will always put it in a way that is very simple to understand. So, but I want to talk about the pyramid level concept. Mm -hmm. So I heard you talk about this quite a bit and it's interesting to me because it deals with an awareness and a learning process and the order of things in which we focus on. And that's of course, for me, I focus on that a lot with the horses. What is the order of the process in which the horse can learn in a good way? So what is, what is the pyramid level concept and when functioning well, what is, or when it's not functioning well, what is the consequence of that? Yeah. Well, mainly is the pyramid level concept is developed by my mentor, uh, Stefan Collier from Switzerland. He's a wonderful person and he's, he's bright and brilliant. And he developed because there were a lot of exercises for visual training, yeah? but they're all sprinter skills. They are just exercises. And if you don't put them in the right order you're not uh, developing a right learning process. The, so the main concept of the pyramid level concept is that you never overstep their frustration level. So we have to start where they are <coughs> and then you can build up more uh, a learning process. And if you put up a little bit too low and if you start a little bit too high, you are not developing the right learning process. Yes. So, and the, it sounds easy, but the difficulty is to find out what is the level then you can start. Yeah, and you always have to respect their learning process. So the accuracy of the process is more important than the speed of the process. Yeah. yeah and that's in, in every training. Yeah. And if I think of the word pyramid, does it then start at the bottom as being the foundation as a very wide, broad, and then you, as you get further up the line, you're getting closer to detail, so you're coming yeah. more to the... <clears throat> and it's not like a cookbook because you are building up the pyramid and sometimes you overstep the first stage. You have to go back. Yeah. If you don't go back, you're frustrating them, and they're not learning. And and that's that's uh, for everybody is different because every circumstance is different, every environment is different, every person is different, the family is different. So it's it, that's why our our work is never boring because it's always different. Yeah. And that's also interesting in what we do when we're teaching the students, especially with the online training, mm -hmm. is that s some people are coming in with an undesired behavior or they're thinking they need some certain information to fit their circumstance and they come in and they go straight to the symptom of a high level yeah. which involves maybe a lot of awareness and a lot of technical steps and then they step to that level yeah. and all of a sudden they're hitting the frustration yeah. because it's difficult and they haven't had the right order of progression to get there yeah. and then they continue to fail all the time yeah. and they get in this bad cycle of not being successful not progressing and then yeah that's that's in every learning process if they are not aware that is just a, a trick of a training. Yeah, they are not aware that they have to do it in daily life. They are not integrating in their daily life. They are just, just tricks. That is called trend skills. And if they are aware of, hey, it's what is the benefit of in my daily life, and they find out, they feel what is happening, yeah. Yeah, then they make progression. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just an exercise. And that's also the nice thing in the book from, from uh, Shankman, the Psycho Behavioral Enhancement. That's what he's telling about. Yeah. If you are not using your intuition and your gut feeling, you don't go anywhere. And in modern times, people are just thinking and not feeling anymore. Yeah, they just read something from the internet. Oh, that's a trick I have to do. Yeah? And in the past, they are more dependent on their intuition. And and that's if you were working with horses, it's intuition. Yeah. You observe and you find out, you feel with your experience, what do you have to do? And if you are not capable to observe and your visual system is really important in observation, then you are not seeing what is happening. You are see you're looking where you're not seeing what is happening. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny that we use so much of the same terms, like when when someone's working with a horse yeah. and 
they're only doing that trick in the arena in that moment. And then they walk out of the arena and they're in a total wrong way of communicating when they're going to the stable. They don't adopt it in all areas of their life for it to become the baseline. It's sort of when they're in the arena, I'm doing that. And when I'm out, I'm doing something else. And, and the last thing you said, um, that, you know, that application of, of what you've just learned, if you don't start to take that on and you're not aware of that in all of the hours in which you are working or operating, then yeah, it is becoming. Yeah. And becoming aware is more, uh, difficult now for the modern people because they are not using that in daily life anymore. Yeah. If you are in the past not aware what is happening in your surrounding, you don't survive. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't catch something or you were eaten by a big animal. Yeah. yeah. And now we are, our surviving system is on the telephone. So how can you ride a horse or working with a horse if we are not aware about your body control and about your surrounding? And that's what we teach people. Yeah. To and then you, you actually, before we were on camera, you mentioned a quote from Shankman in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the mind is like a parachute. It only works when it is open. Yeah. So if you have not an open mind, nothing is coming in. So, and communi communication, that's also a good word that you mentioned. Communication is uh, exchanging of meaningful information. Yeah. But you need different parts of it, you dif different parts of your own body. So your intern communication has to be good. And then you can start with external communication. Yeah. So we talk about inner speech and outer speech. But if your inner speech is not working quite good, how can you use your outer speed? Yeah. And that, that thing, that analogy of the parachute, just like you say, if you're not, parachute is not open, you're falling. Yeah. If your mind is not yeah, open, you're, not you're falling. Yes. Yeah. So, and surviving in, in, in modern times and also in, in ancient times is being aware where you are. Yeah. 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 Learning to learn. This is something, of course, that I am very aware about through, um, teaching students and also working and teaching with the horses to be able to have the horses to have an awareness of the want to learn. But your explanation made so much sense to me in the learning to learn process. Just, just give us your take on that because I, it, it's so relatable to everything in life, especially, and that's what we just went through with the last, there's all these words that I use exactly the same. And it's with the same relevance. Yeah, le learning to learn is is uh, is the same as the pyramid level concept. You learn from your mistakes, and if you are organisms and people and horses and human beings are not, uh, uh, you, you don't allow them to make mistakes, they can't learn. Yeah, because children now overprotected. Yeah? They, they are brought to school. Yeah? They keep out of the street. And if they are not learned what is the danger in the outside, in the in the awareness of the danger, they are not learning. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the same if you are overstepping the frustration level is not not happening, but you are they are not allowed to do something, they're also not developing. So it's always a developmental process. Yeah. And I find that a lot in teaching. You see, um, in cer certain circumstances, coaches are controlling everything this, the student is doing. And as soon as the teacher leaves, then the person hasn't learned to learn. They, they're only being instructed. And the same with the horse, you know, being free and relaxed enough to allow them to feel which is the wrong direction and then to be able to self-correct or self-regulate is the process of learning that this is what I should do in order to be comfortable to manage myself well. And yeah, the learning process should be stimulating and not forcing. Yeah. If you are forcing to learn, you are not learning or you're learning the wrong way. If you're stimulated, you're uh, given uh, an influence and input on the system to do it themselves. Find their own solutions. Yeah. Even if there are bad solutions, they have to find their own solutions. And they find out later if there was a good or a bad solution. Yeah. yeah. I found that very frustrating when I was at school. I always felt that I was forced to learn yeah. and not stimulated. Yeah. I have exactly the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> yep, here we are. <laughs> so, yeah, the next topic... Uh, is also super interesting to me. There's so many words coming up that you say that I can make an analogy for and a connection for that goes in both of our um, practices and what we do. Um, 
But I talk a lot to my students about being aware of their visual system, both in the groundwork, of course, the measurable distance, being aware of where they are in space, but especially when riding, and particularly when riding young horses, because a lot of the time we get to focusing on, and we, we will get to the more details of this later where it gets super exciting, is that you know, riding a young horse, you're thinking about the technical aspect, and then you don't realize that your visual senses are not active, mm-hmm. and therefore it's affecting your physiology, your body, your body language. And so the direction of your body language and the direction of your energy is then somewhat diminished. So when I hear you, you talk about it, you talk about the term of opti- op- uh, optical flow. Yeah. And so what is the definition first of optical flow and when aware of it how can it help in the healthy processing and function of uh, yeah. just not just riding but every day uh, optical flow is is the the most important thing we have because your body is going where your eyes are looking and if your eyes are looking the wrong way or they are not capable to look at the right way how can you steer your body so how can you steer uh, uh, your horse on a on a straight line if your self-direction is not good. So riding a horse starts with knowledge and balance in your own body. And if your own body and especially your eyes are not balanced, your your body is going the wrong way or make the wrong connections in the body to resolve the problem. Yeah, but it's always the cause. Yeah, it's such a nice word, optical flow, because of course the optical part is is the the seeing and then the flow is that that flows on through the whole rest of your body. Yeah. Always, champions always talk about effortless vision. So you don't have to put any effort in your vision. If you have to put some effort in your vision, you are making other connections in your body or your brain to uh, to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's why we always say, talk about a function alters your structure. So we have a wrong function, you have a wrong structure. You know, especially with a horse, if you are training it not good, then they develop the, their body on the wrong way. Yeah. And yeah? it's like bodybuilding. Bodybuilding. If you are doing something with a weight, yeah, and you do it the right way, then you have a perfect designed body and mm-hmm. developed body. If you do it the wrong way, you have a wrong structure. And also, your visual system is also function alt structure. So the wrong structure of the wrong function now these days, looking at the short distance, yeah. they are losing the ability to make the right structure. Yeah. So that you see with young kids with a lot of myopia and all kind of developmental problems because uh, because they are using their mind and body. Not in a natural way anymore. Yeah. So, and if you have someone with like poor uh, optical flow, who is not looking where they're going, which is of course coming from not practicing, yeah. uh, what are the kind of symptoms that com- complaints that develop from that? Uh, most of the time, there are balance problems. If you have literally to, balance problems, li- yeah, or more complaints in your body or your mind on the, on one side of your body. Oh, an imbalance. An imbalance. Yeah. Because balance is always that it's equal on right and left. And front and and in, in totally and up and down it have all be in balance, and if you are out of balance, you are uh, you're trying to find your balance. Yeah, and your visual system is really really important in connecting to have a good balance in your mind and in your body. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. So we move now into something also that is somewhat of a. I see it mostly in the students when I'm teaching them that sometimes the failure of the openness communication connection with the horse the clear um, guidance the good order of movement um, not having an awareness of your body not having an awareness of the of the order your basic body control whether it be groundwork or sitting and riding um, you know that that sometimes I think of that as a process of them just learning about their body. But I know when I talk to you about it, you talk a lot about peripheral awareness. So, what is peripheral awareness? What do so many people? Why do so many people have a problem with it? And I've heard you talk in the past about looking from inside out instead of no outside in instead of inside out. And what does that mean? So what is peripheral awareness? Why do people have a problem with that? And what does that, what does that, what does that mean outside into inside out? 
Yeah, peripheral awareness is actually spatial awareness that you recognize your space and your environment. And that's not only your visual system, it's all your sensory system, your hearing and your feeling and your smelling and your vision. Because when you don't have a good spatial awareness, you couldn't survive in the past. Yeah. And so we have to catch something or you would be catched by something else. Because now people are sitting too much, they are not moving anymore and looking at a short distance, they are unlearning their spatial awareness. And you don't have a clue what is happening in your surrounding, then you're also losing your body control. So now we see, because also by their lack of movement, they don't know what is left, what is right, what is up, what is down. And it should be there without thinking. It should be effortless, really automatically. So when it's not functioning like it should be, there is also a dysfunction in your autonomic nervous system. So that can cause also a lot of health problems. So when your sensory motor system is not fit and not as vital as it should be, then it's, it's, it's waiting for a lot of problems. But that's so many people are feeling sick without being sick yeah. uh, because they are not fit anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> so actually, if you put, if you put most of us into the, the natural environment of the past yeah. and we are picking berries and our peripheral is not working well. The lion is coming and taking a piece of out, out of our ass without us knowing. Yeah. But actually, because we're not in that environment, we're still uh, unhealthy because of the effects in, yeah. in our world of not yeah. having a good peripheral. Yeah, if you think about it clearly, in the last 40, 50 years, there are more changes, especially for our visual system, than in 10,000 years before. Yeah, there's 100 years ago, people are living totally different was no no uh, artificial light, there was no streaming water, there was no cars on the road. It's, and now in, in 100 years it changed totally. And evolutionary, it takes 100,000 years or a million years to evaluate to that. Yeah. yeah, you don't know what the effects of now is until... Uh, you, you see it happen. Yeah. And of course it's not, it's going, it's going incredibly fast now. Yeah, yeah, it's going. So, too fast. And now you see that uh, there is coming more awareness that what we are doing now in modern times is not healthy for our brain and not brain healthy for our body. But as always, it has to be go a lot of time in the wrong direction that people find out, oh, we have to do something different. And then you see the movements now of a lot of people trying to get back to nature, yeah. doing, you know, wick swimming in cold water, yeah. you know, doing a lot more outdoor activities and try feeling the need to get back to because it's always you have to uh hurt your nose before, because you go think about what i have to do out differently yeah yes i have that a lot <laughs> that's learning by doing yeah that's a learning process and if you are not learning for your mistakes then you get a problem yeah uh, it's not it's not it's not a, a bad thing to make mistakes but you have to do something with it and if you don't do something about it, yeah. and that's what I always say, is we have a complaint in your body, a health complaint. It's a healthy signal from your body that you are doing what is not fitting you. Yeah. And if you are ignoring those signals, your brain is telling you, well, I have to take, tell it more clearly because you are not listening. It's not necessarily something wrong, but it is a, a, signal, a that, signal that can tell you, uh, hey. And if you're ignoring the signal, then you get in a burnout. Yeah. Then your system is crashing. Yeah. So actually, most of the time, a burnout is your own fault. Yeah. And so wait, wait, I've heard you also talk in the past about a visual burnout. Yeah. When you visual burnout, if you are using your visual system, not in the way as it should be, as I explained before, then your system is crashing. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And of course, everything that we're doing on a daily basis now in modern society yeah. is leading to that. You never see a visual burnout with a farmer. Or s someone is working in the bush or, uh, or a fire watcher or something like that. Yeah. It's always the indoor professions, they have the visual burnout. Yeah. Because they're using their sensory system on the wrong way. Yeah. It's quite easy. Yeah. It's just logical thing. <laughs> and we see that happening the whole day. Uh, we are just seeing the top of the iceberg. Uh, and so leading to um, having a better peripheral, um, talking about defocus versus focus, so what are the effects of these two? So when I'm teaching both horses and students, the main, um, most of the time, getting a horse or a student to find a relaxed moment is often when they are no longer focusing on that particular task, finding the relaxation through, yeah, 
I wouldn't, uh, I don't have the technical term like defocus, but um, if you're thinking about this, this moment um, of being able to find the relaxation, um, can you explain the difference between focus and defocus? And I've also heard you talk about the enhancement of top athletes by being very aware of this, you know, bouncing the tennis ball and, you know, you see the tennis players bouncing, bouncing, bouncing. And you explained to me one time about them. They're actually looking in at a focused point so that then when they look up, their peripheral is much more enhanced. So what, what first is the difference between defocus and focus? Yeah. Most of the times now we are over-focused. <clears throat> we are not, uh, re not capable to use our defocus system. That's like the peripheral awareness is the defocus system. Mm -hmm. And that's in, part of the peripheral. A, yes, a part of the, it's the process. Yeah. yeah. So in general, to survive, you has should, should be the see the complete picture, and only when necessary, you go to the detail. Yeah. Now it's the other way around. We are always totally yeah. detail first. So <clears throat> then you can't see the whole picture. Yeah. But it's better to see the whole picture and sometimes get back to the detail mm -hmm. in the focus. And if you are not able to lose your focus, you can't defocus, then you are in problem. That's what we see in daily life happen. They can't defocus anymore. And, and like a good tennis player, they are focusing on the ball, but at the same time, they are aware what is happening in the surrounding. So they have it on a very high level, a very really high, high level neurological connection between spatial awareness and detail awareness. Like our uh, Max Verstappen, is our the, the best Formula drive one, uh, driver now for this model, he has it on a very high neurological level. He can focus on a millimeter how to steer in a corner. Yeah. At the same time, he's, he's speaking with his pits. And they have 300 k's an hour. Huh? Yeah. And do it at the same time in a relaxed mode. Yeah. Because he is in a relaxed mode because you are in full control. Yeah. And if you are not in full control of your sensory system, you are losing it. Yeah. And then you get in a stress situation. Yeah. Yeah. So how is the best way to, to be able to cre create more opportunities or the ability to defocus uh, training yeah training and training in daily life yeah get rid of your telephone and look what's happening in your surrounding yeah and just if you uh, we, we can do exercises but if you are not integrated in daily life there's no improvement so you have to be aware in your mind in your body that you have to do it all day and looking at you at the same time i see the cameraman yeah yeah and but because it takes no effort to use for me because I'm really trained with it. Yeah. Otherwise, they are uh, people are losing that sense. Yeah. And if you are losing that sense, you can't function on a proper way anymore. Since it makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's logical. It's just thinking about our natural function. What is our brain made for, and what is our body made for? Yeah. And if you aren't using it on a proper way, so our 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 body is made for facial exercise. Then you have your healthy uh, exhaustion. Yeah. And if you look on the screen, you have your unhealthy exhaustion. Yeah. Eh? No, it's ruining our brain and our natural development. And I often see that if I have a student that's coming from an office job and they come to the horse, of course, you have the whole energy of the work. Yeah. But when they are starting to work with the horse, you know, they pick up the rope yeah. and they go like this. And then they look at the horse and then they say, Okay, now start to get some movement from the whip. And then they look at the whip. The, there's not this relaxed, okay, I'm feeling where I am yeah. and I'm able to, so maybe a good exercise in the beginning to say, look at me and what do you see here yeah. in order for them to be able to defocus, relax and get a better peripheral. Maybe it's a good exercise to train that you chase them with a whip. <laughs> 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 then they have to be aware of what's happening in That's the surrounding. Right. <laughs> I'm coming. Can you see me? Don't are, look at me. Are you awake? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that leads us, of course, it's perfect. This is going really as a natural flow. We're having optical flow. Um, instinct versus thinking. Yeah. Now, I watched a lot of Bruce Lee movies when I was young. Mm -hmm. And I remember one line, and that served me incredibly well through working with horses and my own development and, and through life. And... The line was, Bruce Lee is there and he's with his student. He's just finished drinking tea in the forest and he's coming and he, it's Lao's time. And then he says to Lao, um, he asks him, he says, kick me. 
and then the boy goes to kick and he says, uh, what was that? An exhibition? You need emotional content. And then he said, it's like a finger pointing away to the moon. And then he gives him a slap on the head and he says, don't concentrate on the finger or you'll miss all that heavenly glory. And that, that thing about uh, instinct, not thinking, don't think. He said, this was the line. He says, don't think, feel. It's like a po finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger or you'll miss all that heavenly glory. So the don't think but feel, that got that was one line that stuck with me. And I used that. I th thought of that in the early days with the horses. And so, and I think that develops a certain le level of instinct. So but what is your take on on the instinct versus thinking, how is the... It's a perfect example, uh, Tristan, because in modern times we are losing our ability to feel. Yeah, In past times, if you are not feeling, you are not aware, you could not survive. Now we are thinking that we are doing something and we are not observing what we're seeing. Yeah, Sometimes you are filling it up with our mind. And if you are not a good observant, you are losing the ability to, to actually see what's happening. And so your sensory system has to be trained fully, totally day, that you can use your instinct. So we have a big new cortex as human beings, but it's a disadvantage. A horse can't think. Yeah. So if he are allowed to choose his own way, he finds his good way. And we are, as people, as human beings, we're thinking for the horse. That's why starting the problem. The thinking is a disadvantage. It's a disadvantage. Yeah. yeah it's disadvantages in feeling. Yeah. Yeah, it's complicating the it's feeling. Complicating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So stop thinking and start feeling. And the more that you can, if you are have a good feeling, they can just think on the right way. So thinking is a good thing if you have used in the right order. Yeah. But it starts with feeling. Yeah. And like you all said, is the order of movement is the order of how you use your neurological systems. And it starts with feeling. And your feeling is really dependent on your sensory system. So if your sensory system is not taking the right information out of space, you are choosing the wrong direction. So it's all interlinked. It's interlinked. And when stu people say stupid things, it's because they think first before feeling what's going on. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Or you make a bad decision because you, before you've taken the time to feel what's happening, you've thought what to do, and then yeah, but you make a mistake. Decision making should be on your observation. And if your observations are not proper or not easily or not effortless, you are making the wrong decisions. Uh, yeah. yeah. So feeling before thought. Uh, together with thought. Together. Together. It's not, it's not, they are not disconnected, they are connected. But it has to be in the right order. Start feeling and right away start with the right thinking. And if it takes too much time, you also, also, you don't survive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so now we get to behavioral responses and interactions. So when I'm working with my horses and I'm thinking of that ultimate goal as being trying to, the ultimate goal is of course, to minimize everything and to have the most minimal aid, that it's refined so much that it's this invisible conversation that from the outside looks effortless, but on the inside, the con connection is incredibly strong. So when I hear you talk about a reaction on a stimulus you talk about a minimal stimulus followed by a maximal response so what does that mean in a if a human is uh, in an optimal process how can we how can we achieve that if your sensory system is working on a high level it don't need that much information because your filtering system is exactly taking the right spot from the information and if your sensory process is not on a high level, you have to be a stronger stimulus. So you're too late with your response. Yeah. Yeah, like like a, a, a musician, a really trained musician, before the music starts, he already knows what it is because he has a really high developed auditory, auditory system. And it's also your visual system can be on a really high level. Yeah. So if you just have a, just a short look and you really know what it is. Yeah. And a slow looker, and a not a careful and not a precise looker or seeing, they take more time. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because, <clears throat> of course, that is the thing you see failing when someone is working 
with the horse and they need heavy, strong aids that are sometimes, yeah, too much or, you know, outside the box or they don't get to that refined space. And it was in I have a, a working student here now, Kiralee from Australia, and she's not had a great deal of experience, um, but she was uh, a ballet dancer at a really high level. And I asked her at one stage to just take one of the young horses, one of the horses you bred actually, st- came straight from the free stable. So he was fresh with a lot of power and not yet the knowledge to control himself. So there was going to be, you know, a lot of things to, to be able to manage in that situation. And the other girls were looking at me like, are you sure? Like you want the new uh, stagiaire, the new working student to take the horse out? And I said, yeah, it'll be okay. And of course, he came into the arena and, you know, he was snorting with the tail up and he's about to have an explosion. And without the technical knowledge of the execution of what she should do, because that was not learnt yet, hadn't got that far yet, but she had a, she, from the ballet, she has a very good awareness of her own body, where she is within the space from dancing in relation to what is around her. So she knows where she is within the space and she knows where she is precisely without looking where she is in relation to the horse. And therefore she was able to communicate in a way to diffuse this explosive energy almost unconsciously in a very refined way that the girls were sitting there. They could see the explosion happening thinking, oh my God, this girl's going to die. And then in one second, the situation was diffused. They didn't really see what she did. And so, yeah, that sort of very minimal input in a moment that could have been disastrous gave a maximum result and I can only put it down to that fact of this good awareness of her body. Yeah, and because and the horse they don't think they recognize the the body control of the other person. Yeah? Because I don't have to be afraid because that people is in control control over himself. Why should I be afraid of what somebody is in over controlling himself? They don't do stupid stupid things. And people are not controlled the same. They, they have don't to have make, to be suspicious yeah, of that person. Yeah, because they are trusting it. And they have their they have a way higher developed mental instinct. So they recognize it. Yeah, it's the same with horses and all the animals. They they recognize what what kind of people I can trust. Should we be afraid or not be afraid? And if somebody is uncontrolled over their own body and mind, animals really recognize it immediately. So it's a really nice example. Yeah. And of course the horses uh, have not watched the TOT online training, so they don't know the technical <laughs> aspects. So, <laughs> so, um, so people may have noticed now that you are uh, 65 plus, but you're not wearing glasses. Yeah. Uh, because I know all my life what I had to do to keep my eyes as, as, as uh, no, my system as fit as possible. That's why I'm still working, because that makes my, my brain uh, uh, keep on functioning. And that's why I do a lot of, yeah, every day a lot of sports, because a physical system that is fit is also a visual system that is fit. Yeah. And I know exactly what a kind of eye exercise, but it's not only the eye exercise, it's the total, it's my way of living. Yeah. Huh? Well, we've talked about today, it's, it's yeah. encompassing all things. Yeah, and not compensating, try to keep it, uh, not to, to find the product who is helping you, how can I help my body to get as fit as possible that I no need all kind of products? And giving the opportunity for the body to keep you help. It will change over time, but for now I'm happy with it. Yeah. Help. And so, of course, there's a lot of things we can give the people on becoming optimal performers and to operate at a high level and a high frequency. Um, but you often say to me the best way is to keep things simple. So... We could, of course, talk for many, many hours on all of these topics and extend them to yeah. <laughs> incredible length. And, of course, a lot of people will for sure get a lot out of this podcast. So this will, of course, not be the only one. But what is some advice you can give people in order for them just to lead a more balanced and healthy life? Exercise. Yeah, our body is made for moving and outside. Yeah, the first thing our patients is say, you not only need training, you have to go outside. Seek for sunlight, drink some water. Our brain is just like a like a flower. If you don't give them light and water, it's not never going to be a beautiful flower. And also, our brain needs water and light. Just go outside, move, and be aware of your surrounding. Yeah. 
And that's 50% of the solution to, to, to get to a better visual function. And if you are realizing that it's happening, then you are motivated. But first you have to feel. And, and sometimes uh, the bodies and brains are um, uh, don't want to have that solution for that time. Yeah. So we have to work on it. Uh, it's not a quick quick solution. It's it's a, you have to your, your mindset should be different. Uh, you have to open your mind and you have to feel yourself. What is changing really? And when you, if you're aware of the changing in your body and brain, then you are on the right track. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it's just a trick. Yeah. So people is very important. So my most part of the, uh, task in you know, my work is communication to tell them and to let them feel what is happening in their body. Otherwise, just a trick. Yeah, that's the difference between a, a good trainer and a bad trainer. Yeah. Yeah, a, a bad trainer just doing exercises, and a good training is, are you realizing what are you doing? Yeah. And what is you doing with your body and your brain, and what is you doing with your functioning? Yeah. And if you're not aware of your improved function, you never get better. Yeah. And I love that quote, natural organism living in a natural space. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and it's so logical as it can be. Yeah, and that's the, that's eighty percent of the work. Yeah, uh, natural recovery comes in a natural situation. So if you keep on watching on your telephone and stay in the television and laying in the couch, you never get fit. Yeah. So people, you've heard it here. Keep it natural, horse natural ship. And uh, thank you very much for your time today, Rob. I'm sure there's going to be so many things that come up in my mind watching this back and. There's so many people going to benefit from this conversation. Thank you, Tristan, to chair our 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 look of, of the world. I think it's uh, if more people are thinking like that, it's better for horses and for humans. Uh, we are creating a better world. So, guys, remember you can see this on or hear this, download this on all the podcast channels. You can see it on TAT Methods YouTube channel. Stay tuned. Be good to your horses, and we'll see you next time.